Even with Abiola in detention, Abacha had other powerful enemies who were roaming free. The 1994 Constitutional Conference unwittingly set in motion a chain of events that threatened the lives of several military officers and members of the opposition. Shehu, that is Usman. <laughs> Musa Eradwa. Yeradwa had been elected as a conference delegate. He was a political heavyweight, wealthy, a great political strategist who still harbored ambitions of becoming president. He was from a Fulani royal family who were Nigeria's equivalent of the Kennedys, a wealthy political oligarchy. He had the traditional title of Tafidan Katsina. His father, Musa Yaradua, was the former minister for Lagos and also the Mutawalen Katsina, which is the custodian of the treasury of the Katsina Emirates Council. He was also a nephew of the former military governor of the Northern Region and Chief of Staff Army, Major General Hassan Usman Katsina. As a young man, Yaradua had been a maverick. He attended the Katsina Provincial Secondary School. One of his classmates there was the future head of state, Major General Muhammadu Buhari. After attending the NMTC, Yaradua was admitted to the elite Sanos Royal Military Academy in England. Yaradua fought during the Civil War as a member of the Federal Army 2nd Division commanded by Colonel Mutala Mohammed. Some senior officers wanted Mohammed to be court martialed after he disobeyed orders from Supreme Headquarters during a botched river crossing that led to the loss of over a thousand of his men and millions of pounds worth of military equipment. However, any plans for a court martial were dropped after Yaradua and other sub officers threatened to mutiny if Mohammed was punished. Yaradua was a ringleader in two coup plots. During the July 1966 counter coup, he was tasked with the primary responsibility in the southeast. His mission was to apprehend or eliminate the military governor of the eastern region, Lieutenant Colonel of Ujuku. Just as Yaradua and his colleagues were preparing to strike, their battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel David Ugunewe, found them in the early hours of the morning already awake, dressed in battle attire and ready to commence the coup in Enugu. A tense and angry exchange between Ogunewe and the northern soldiers then followed. Remarkably, Ogunewe somehow managed to talk down the northern soldiers, avoided bloodshed, and convinced them to hand the armory keys to him. Nine years later, Yaradua was at it again. He was one of the six colonels, including Buhari and Babangida, who planned and staged a coup against General Gowon on July 29, 1975. Yaradua's job was to persuade other officers to join the plots. He duly recruited Lieutenant Colonel Dobangida and MD Jeddah and Major Aliu Mohammed Kusau. Yaradua also had the job of visiting Brigadier Mutala Mohammed at his house to inform him that he would become the head of state if the coup succeeded. The night before the coup, Yaradua moved his wife Binta and their children to the home of his cousin M.T. Usman. Around 7 p.m., Yaradua stepped outside with Usman and bluntly told him, Tonight, we are going to take over the government. So in case anything goes wrong, this is goodbye. Usman was so shocked and frightened by the news that he could not sleep that night. Usman, his wife, Yaradua's wife, and the entire household stayed awake all night praying and awaiting the news of the cool success. This duly came the following morning when the Brigade of Guards Commander, Colonel Joseph Garba, announced the regime change. There was a bloodless coup today in Nigeria, which is Black Africa's biggest and richest nation and the world's eighth largest oil producer. The overthrow of strongman Major General Yakabu Gowan reportedly was engineered by the head of his personal bodyguards. The new regime, led by Brigadier Mutala Mohamed, appointed Yaradua as the Federal Commissioner for Transports. However, Mohammed lasted only six months. On February 13, 1976, soldiers from minority ethnic groups in the Middle Belt ambushed Mohammed's car 
and assassinated him during a failed coup attempt. The majority of the army remained loyal, rallied behind the chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Theophilus Danjuma, and suppressed the coup. Mohammed's deputy, Lieutenant General Olusha Gunnobasanjo, succeeded him as head of state. With Obasanjo and Danjuma at the top of the new regime, the coup net effect was to place the two most high-profile positions in the government in the hands of Christians. To assuage the feelings of the Muslim North, it was important to place a Muslim Hausa or Fulani in a highly visible position. Danjuma identified two leading contenders, the former boyhood classmates Buhari and Yaradua, both of whom were Fulani Muslims from the Northwest. Lieutenant Colonel Yaradua was duly promoted to the rank of brigadier over several senior officers in order to make him a passenger's deputy. He was later promoted again to Major General and retired with Obasanjo when the military ceded power to an elected civilian government in 1979. Thereafter, he became a successful businessman with interest in various industries including agriculture, banking, media and shipping. He also remained active in politics and vied for the presidential nomination of the SDP. By 1994, the chain-smoking Yaradua was no longer a scheming young army officer, but had become an influential and sophisticated political player, with contacts all around the country. His political protégés include Atiku Abubakar, former police officer Tony Aneni, and Yomi Edu. Yaradua also had a personal history with Abacha. During the Civil War, both men fought as members of the Army 2nd Division under Colonel Mutala Mohammed. When Yaradua went to Pakistan in 1974 to attend a 10-month course at the Command and Staff College in Quetta, he sold his Mercedes 280 coupe to Abacha. There was also a complex family dynamic between them. Abacha was not his wife Miriam's first husband. Her first husband was Yaradua's father-in-law. Shehu Usman, the Saraki Musa of Fontua district in Katina. Usman was the father of Yaradua's wife, Binta. Miriam was briefly married to Usman for one or two years before divorcing him and later marrying Abacha in 1965. After Abacha became head of state, Yaradua consistently demanded that he should make clear how long he intended to stay in power. Abacha revealed little beyond a vague statement from his deputy, Dia, our stay will be brief. On June 27, 1994, Abacha established a national constitutional conference to design a new constitution for Nigeria. The conference was expected to be little more than a glorified talking shop to keep the politicians busy, distracted and well-fed while Abacha consolidated himself in power. A conference member complained that since we came, no senior government official ever showed any interest in what we were doing here. Another member described their daily routines as sleep, wake up, eat, attend brief meeting, and cocktails, eat, and sleep. The plan seemed to be working until proceedings became unexpectedly lively. The conference was empowered to determine General Abacha's tenure. Barnabas Gemadi led a 30-member political transition committee. In December 1994, the Gemadi committee recommended a further two-year tenure for the military, which would extend military rule until December 31, 1997. However, Yaragua was determined to use the conference as a platform to push the military out of power as soon as possible. His supporters went to work. On December 6, 1994, Another conference member, Sule Odoma, a medical director of Igala Ethnicity, proposed a motion rejecting the December 1997 exit date for the military. The conference supported him, vetoed the Gemari Committee's recommendation, and instead passed a motion calling on the military to leave office no later than January 1, 1996. This motion rattled the government. Yaragua had played his best card. Now it was the government's turn to respond. The following day, 
the government ordered members of the conference transition committee to return their official cards issued to them for servicing. Senior government officials also met with the conference chairman, Adolphus Kabiri White, and lobbied conference delegates to revoke the motion. In his memoirs, Abacha's first chief of army staff, Major General Chris Ali, claimed that on one occasion, while he and Abacha discussed Yaradua, Abacha snapped his fingers and swore, I will get him, including that of Basanjo. Yaradua had attracted the attention of the security forces before. The State Security Service arrested him in early 1994, then released him. Now he had given them another reason to take renewed interest in him. The government intensified its pressure on conference members by suddenly adjourning the conference. At 1am on March 9, 1995, eight army security officers, including the Commissioner of Police for the Federal Capital Territory, surrounded Yaradua's residence in a poor conference village in Abuja. The security men had a warrant signed by the Inspector General of Police, Ibrahim Kumasi, and arrested Yaradua for acts prejudicial to state security and for worsening the economic adversity of the states. The officers flew Yaradua south to Lagos and detained him at the Kirikiri Maximum Security Prison, Nigeria's most notorious Gao. The conference reconvened in April without Yaradua. Some conference delegates suddenly changed their minds about the January 1996 handover dates. Conference delegates Tony Aneni and 35 others tabled the new motion, stating that the January 1, 1996 terminal date for military rule is not realistic. Justice Karibi White initially resisted reopening the issue as it had already been determined. However, the conference vacated its earlier January 1, 1996 motion and on April 25, 1995, passed a new unanimous motion allowing the military to determine how long it will remain in power. By doing so, the conference violated its own rule of not reopening issues that had already been decided. Several conference members, loyal to Yaradua and other prominent members, such as Alex Ekweme, did not attend the session where this motion was passed. Rather than framing the parameters of what Abacha governments could and could not do, the conference ended up consolidating the government's power and giving it carte blanche to do as it pleased. Abacha had made good on his promise to get Yaradua, one down, one to go. Since leaving power, former head of state General Obasanjo had been in the habit of criticizing all his successors. Shagari, Buhari, Babangida, Shonikon, and now Abacha. President Shagari was so irritated by Obasanjo's criticism that he asked his secretary to the government, Shehu Musa, to visit Obasanjo in his hometown of Ota and find out why he has been making embarrassing public statements against the administration. Shagari alleged that some public statements by General Obasanjo severely criticizing the administration seemed to point to at least a tacit incitement of the military against the government. He also pointed out that military officers frequently visited Obasanjo's home before the 1983 coup that deposed Shagari. According to Babangida, the coup leaders asked Obasanjo to lead the new military government, but Obasanjo declined because he said it would destroy his integrity, that he handed over to Shagari and that it is not right for him to get involved. But he said he was not stopping us from going ahead with the plot. After Abacha seized power in 1993, he met Obasanjo and asked for his advice on how long the military should stay in power. Obasanjo replied, you have no business being there not to talk about how long you can stay there. By 1994, Obasanjo's rhetoric against Abacha had become more critical. In a televised edition of the BBC news program Newsnight, he accused the Abacha government of spending money like a drunken sailor and asked where is all the money going. While other critics were sent to prison to reassess their views, nothing happened to Obasanjo. His larger-than-life status made him seemingly untouchable. 
Obasanjo was not like the others who had been arrested and imprisoned. Obasanjo's story is like a guide to post-independent Nigerian history. He was either a direct participant in or a witness to virtually all seminal post-independent historical events. As an army officer, he served in the colonial Nigerian army when he was still controlled by the British and remained in the army when Britain transferred command to Nigerian officers in 1965. He served in the first African-led UN peacekeeping mission in the Congo and his best friend Chukuma Kaduna Nzego was one of the ringleaders of Nigeria's first military coup on January 15, 1966. He was a former head of state, the first military ruler to hand over power to an elected civilian government and the victorious civil war hero who obtained the military surrender that preserved the Nigerian Union. He nearly became United Nations Secretary General and also made a diplomatic breakthrough which led to Nelson Mandela being released after decades in prison. He also had extensive local and international contacts. However, Abacha was unlike the other heads of state that Obasanjo had criticized. Abacha was not interested in being popular and had no fear or respect for big name reputations. Power or the perception that one has it can impair a person's reasoning and scramble their radar for sensing danger. Obasanjo was abroad attending the United Nations Conference in Denmark when his friend Yaradua was arrested. Yaradua's arrest convinced Obasanjo's Nigerian and foreign friends that he would be next. Several of them, including the US ambassador to Nigeria, Walter Carrington, warned him not to return to Nigeria. Carrington offered Obasanjo asylum in America, but Obasanjo rejected the offer, countering that he had not committed any crime and thus had no reason to remain abroad. In an act of spectacular hubris, Obasanjo returned to Nigeria on March 13th. Security officers seized his passport upon his arrival at the Mutala Mohammed Airport in Lagos, then arrested him the next day. He was detained at the Zone 2 headquarters of the Nigerian police at Onikon in Lagos, then moved to the police headquarters in Molono Street. Obasanjo's good friend, former US President Jimmy Carter, traveled to Nigeria on his behalf and met Abacha on March 20th to appeal for Obasanjo's release. Abacha found it difficult to ignore a revered former US president and compromised. He authorized Obasanjo's release from detention and instead kept him under house arrest at his farm in Ota from March 22nd. He remained under house arrest for the next two months until June 14th when armed soldiers took him from his farmhouse to the Army of Sassimus in Milverton Road in Ikoi, Lagos. In February 1995, a few weeks before Obasanjo was arrested, the prolific Nigeria rumor mill claimed that there had been an attempted coup against Abacha and that the government was secretly arresting suspects. The rumors became so strong that on March 7, the Director of Defense Information, Brigadier General Chijuka, publicly denied the arrest and dismissed them as stabilizing rumors. Only three days after the Director of Defense Information had denied the arrest or the existence of a coup plot, the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Abdul Salam Abubakar, confirmed that the government had indeed foiled the coup and that some officers had been arrested. However, Abubakar did not disclose their identities. The government's denial followed by its confirmation made the public skeptical. When the coup rumors first started, the Director of Military Intelligence Major General Abdullah Isariki Mukhtar had investigated but found no evidence of a plot. Mukhtar was from the Corps of Military Police and had a law degree. Mukhtar's conclusion led Abacha to reshuffle the intelligence network. He reassigned Mukhtar then appointed Brigadier General Ibrahim Sabu, an infantry officer with no background in military intelligence, to replace him. He also appointed Air Vice Marshal Idi Musa as the Chief of Defense Intelligence. The new intelligence team dug for evidence of coup more feverishly than their predecessors and secretly arrested several more officers without public announcements. The government set up a special investigation panel led by Brigadier General Felix Mujakwero to investigate the coup allegations. 
Wujakwero was an Urubu from Delta State and had won the sort of honor for being the best cadet from his graduating class in 1971. The suspects dreaded facing the SIP's interrogation team. The feared pipe-smoking Colonel Frank Omenka was the head of the security group at the Directorate of Military Intelligence. He was intelligent, multilingual, and a ruthless interrogator with a large bag of physical and psychological tools that he used on detainees to extract information. In 1995, forensic evidence was like science fiction in Nigeria. Hence, without it, security forces often relied on confessions as a primary method of evidence gathering. To facilitate the rapid extractions of confession, they often resorted to torture. The chief torturers were Lieutenant Colonel Frank Omenka and Hassan Zakari Biu. Throughout your career as a police officer, yes. did you attend any course on terrorism or counter-terrorism? I was I, now, uh, I'm Mr. Mr. Out. Mr. Mr. Bill, you my me, question is very clear. Would, because you have a service record, which I will would, show. So if see, I have a service record, my lord, I think it's very clear. That, Don't that make, answer we are not that answer, that, that Just answer, answer my question. question. Okay. I said, in your throughout your career in the in the police force, yes. did you attend any course on terrorism or counter-terrorism? No, my lord. You, you, you never attended any, any course on counter-terrorism? Yes, my lord. Are you aware that the issue of counter-terrorism, terrorism or counter-terrorism anywhere in the world are handled by professional experts? That is, I will answer this question in two ways, my lord. Colonel Lawan Badabe was tortured so badly that he lost consciousness and could not walk for several weeks thereafter. Another favored form of torture was to tie several suspects together, semi-naked, leave them outside in the open overnight, next to hidden microphones and listen in on their conversations to find out whether they would reveal any incriminating information. Other suspects also encountered tough interrogation at the hands of Omenka, Colonel Kolawole John Olu, Lieutenant Colonel Mahmoud Santuraki and Assistant Commissioner of Police Hassan Zakari Biu. The SIP claimed to have found evidence of three different but overlapping coup plots, one allegedly headed by Colonel Guarabe and Bello Fadile, a second led by Major Akinloye Akinyemi, and a third led by Yaradua, which recommended a trial. On June 5, 1995, the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Abubakar, established a special military tribunal to try the suspects. The government did not name those involved, but there was great speculation that Jaradwa and Obasanjo were among them. Brigadier General Patrick Aziza and Urubu from Delta State led the tribunal. The trial took place in the conference room of the Lagos Garrison Command on Kofo Abayomi Street. Victoria Island, Lagos. But in typical Nigerian fashion, it would not start for another six hours. Aziza called each defendant's name and asked if they had an objection to the inclusion of any tribunal members. Obasanjo, who was the most senior officer ever to be tried for coup plotting, objected to being tried by a junior officer like Aziza. Trial by an officer of at least equal rank was standard procedure in court martials. As a four-star general, the only officer of equivalent rank in the whole of Nigeria was Abacha himself. Obasanjo's objection was predictably denied. Nonetheless, in strange deference to military norms, Aziza referred to Obasanjo and Gerardua as Sir each time he addressed them, even though he held the power of life and death over both of them. The alleged coup plots were bewildering and opaque. The intricate details that the prosecution presented about the three overlapping plots are summarized below. Plot 1, Yaradua. Yaradua was charged with conspiracy to commit treason, concealment of treason, illegal possession of firearms and stealing. The prosecution alleged that Yaradua instigated another plot by inciting Babangida's former ADC, Lieutenant Colonel Sambu Dasuki, who had been a key member of the Babangida government, 
and who was also the son of the Sultan of Sokoto, Ibrahim Dasuki. Although Sango Dasuki had moved to Washington DC, the SIP alleged that he sponsored Bello Fadile to travel around Nigeria to recruit more officers into the plot. Dasuki in turn supposedly recruited Bello Fadile and Lieutenant Colonels Bulus, Usman and M.A. Ajayi. The government declared Dasuki a suspect in the coup and wanted fugitive from justice. Plot 2. Guadabi and Bello Fadile After being interrogated, Bello Fadile alleged that at the behest of Dasuki, he met Yadua to obtain funds for a coup. According to the prosecution, Dasuki also asked Bello Fadile to recruit Guadabi. Bello Fadile allegedly met with Guadabi at Boni Camp Lagos in early 1994. At that meeting, it was said that Guadabi and Bello Fadile hatched the plot and Guadabi decided to contribute money towards it. Bello Fadile also claimed that some Americans had provided him with a detailed layout of the presidential villa which they would storm using former presidential bodyguards. The prosecution alleged that they recruited Colonels Gabriel Ajayi, Roland Emokwe, and Emmanuel Ndubweze, and Lieutenant Colonels Igwe, Obalisa, Olowokun, and Mapayeda to assist them. The plot was finalized on February 15, 1995, during the Army's annual legal seminar. The plan was to assassinate Abacha using snipers or explosives on March 1, 1995, at the Sala Praying Ground. They would then arrest all the army GOCs and eliminate all officers of the rank of Brigadier General and above. After displacing Abacha, they planned to use retired senior army officers to gain credibility for the new regime, then discard them as soon as the regime stabilized. Plot 3 Major Akinyemi Major Akinyemi's plot was supposedly the most elaborate. The prosecution alleged that in order to start a guerrilla war, Akinyemi planned to create a paramilitary group in Lagos by setting up a Bogo security company. Strangely, this was exactly the same method that the 1990 coup plotters had used to recruit armed men from their coup in which Akinyemi was a co-accused. It would have been incredibly naive of Akinyemi to attempt another coup using the exact same method, which had been foiled five years earlier. Nonetheless, the prosecution claimed that Akinyemi had divided the country into seven sectors Lagos, Ibadan, Enugu, Benin, Jos, Abuja, and Potakot. His armed recruits would then dress in white robes during the day to avoid detection before striking their targets. The defenders pleaded not guilty and denied plotting or knowing anything about the plan. Bello Fadile sought to retract his confession in which had implicated Yaradua or Basanjo and others. They claimed they were obtained under duress after he had been severely tortured. Yaradua admitted that he had met Colonel Bello Fadile twice in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel. He said that was their first meeting. They discussed the work of a judicial panel in which Bello Fadile was involved, but he could not remember what they had talked about at the second meeting. When security officers searched Yaradua's house in Kaduna, he found an old submachine gun which he had used during the Civil War. He claimed that he kept the gun for sentimental reasons. However, prosecutors charged him with illegal possession of the gun and also alleged that Yaradua and 150 of his supporters met in Lagos at the end of February 1995 to finalize arrangements for the plot. Yaradua denied having been in Lagos in February. He said that as it was Ramadan, he had not left the north. Investigators also claimed that Bello Fadile visited Obasanjo at his farm in the first week of February 1995 and informed him about the coup. During the Special Investigation Panel's investigation, Obasanjo asked Bello Fadile to tell him exactly where on his farm they had met. Bello Fadile claimed it was in his office. Obasanjo said this was not true as he had not received guests in his office for over two years. His driver corroborated with this and told the investigators that he had not seen about St. Jerome meet guests in his office for years. An ever officer also testified on Abbasanjo's behalf that Bello Fadile could not have met Abbasanjo in Ota during the first week of February as Bello Fadile was in Abuja on February 1st and 2nd and Abbasanjo was abroad from February 2nd until February 9th. 
According to Obasanjo, investigators had provided Bello Fadile with his sketch of his farm after torturing him, tutored him so he could claim to have met Obasanjo at locations on the farm to which he had never actually been. For failing to report the alleged visit from Bello Fadile, Obasanjo was charged with concealment of treason, a crime invented under Obasanjo's watch in 1976. After the failed 1976 coup, investigators discovered that many of those they wanted to prosecute had not physically taken part in the coup. Rather, they had heard rumors about the possible coup but failed to report them to the authorities. To get around this inconvenient hurdle, the government, then led by Obasanjo, enacted Decree 8 of 1976, the Treason and Other Offenses Special Military Tribunal Decree. This created a new crime referred to as concealment of treason. Abacha's agents did not tire of reminding Obasanjo that he was the architect of his own misfortune since it was his government that had introduced the crime of concealment of treason into Nigerian law. There was a further allegation against Obasanjo that he visited the detained Abiola in November 1994 and afterwards wrote a letter to Abacha stating that if anything happened to Abiola in detention, Abacha would be regarded as a murderer. The Special Investigation Panel produced a copy of the letter as evidence against Obasanjo. On Friday, July 14, 1995, Brigadier General Chijuka publicly announced that the tribunal had tried 51 people. Of these, seven defendants were acquitted, an eighth unnamed person was also acquitted, but his case was referred for further consideration. Although the authorities had not announced the names of those on trial or the sentences, news of the coup plots and trials leaked out. Local and foreign media were demanding explanations from the Nigerian government and were not convinced that there was really a coup. Nigerian media termed the affair a phantom coup, an imaginary plot cooked up by the government as a convenient way of eliminating its rivals. The fact that those convicted were a motley crew of retired generals, civil society campaigners, journalists and reporters, all of whom just happened to be government opponents, deepened the skepticism. As rumours that Yaradwa had been sentenced to death and Obasanjo to life imprisonment gripped the national and international media, foreign countries sent a wave of appeals for the death sentences to be commuted and for those convicted to be released. President Mandela of South Africa, Clinton of the US, Mugabe of Zimbabwe, and Bia of Cameroon, the ECOWAS chairman, President Jerry Rollins of Ghana, the United Nations, Britain, France, Germany, and the Vatican sent appeals and emissaries to Abacha to urge clemency. The appeals also split the military. Officers sent competing petitions some for the sentences to be commuted and others for them to be carried out. When Abacha visited Sokoto State on Tuesday, August 1st, 1995, the state military administrator, Colonel Yakubu Muazu, who was Abacha's former military assistant, urged him publicly in the presence of Ibrahim Dasuki, the Sultan of Sokoto, whose son was a suspect in the coup, to ignore the pleas for clemency. A few days later, the military administrator of Ogun State, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Akintonde, who was Diaz's former ADC, called for clemency. The sharp difference in views between Abacha's former military assistant and Diaz's former ADC was itself emblematic of the growing rift between Abacha and Dia. Middle Belt officers were another important constituency. Many of them rejected clemency for those convicted and argued that 1976 and 1986 coup, in which Middle Belt officers had been swiftly executed, had set precedence for the treatment of convicted coup plotters. They further argued that the appeals for clemency were evidence of double standards simply because most of the 1995 accused were from majority ethnic groups, unlike those in 1976 and 1986 plots. Middle Belt officers doubtless remembered that Obasanjo was the head of the government that had approved the execution of their kinsmen in 1976. As the pro and anti-execution arguments went back and forth, 
The convicted men remained nervously on death row, unsure of what would happen to them. Some of them sent final instructions to their spouses and children. Gerardua feared that he would be executed at any moment. Three days after his death sentence, he sent a copy of his will and a notebook with instructions to his political protégé, Atiku Abubakar. The psychological uncertainty got the best of some of the convicted men who succumbed to depression or illness. The Christians and Muslims among them constantly read their Bibles and Korans and formed impromptu prayer groups. As a former head of state, Obasanjo was spared some of the indignities inflicted on the others. He was not chained and had his own cell. He and Yaradua were sources of inspiration and leadership to the other convicts. A publication claimed that the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Abubakar, was the only serving army officer who had the courage to visit Obasanjo in prison. Abubakar apparently did so in order to commiserate with Obasanjo and to disassociate himself with any involvement in his incarceration. Obasanjo's longtime friends and former military colleagues, Lieutenant General Danjuma and Major General Joseph Garba, also visited him. Danjuma had been Chief of Army Staff and Garba, the Federal Commissioner for External Affairs, when Obasanjo was head of state. Danjuma was known for being stern and unemotional. When he saw his former boss humiliated and imprisoned with armed robbers and murderers, he shed tears and told him, you should not be here. Garba also wept when he saw Obasanjo, unable to speak or stop his tears. Garba simply shook his head. On July 22nd, the prisoners were terrified by the booming sounds of gunfire inside the Kirikiri prison as soldiers executed a large number of death row inmates by firing squad non-stop for 90 minutes. These were 43 armed robbers whose execution the government had approved. The executions were the government's attempt to demonstrate strength in response to international pressure and to intimidate the coup prisoners by suggesting that they might be next. On October 1, 1995, Abacha addressed the nation. The coup prisoners would not be released, but none of them would be executed either. Those that were sentenced to death had their sentences commuted to life or 25 imprisonments. Those sentenced to life imprisonment had their sentences reduced to 15 years. The journalists convicted of being accessories after the facts also had their sentences reduced to 15 years. It was the first time in Nigeria's history that death sentences for coup plotting had been revoked. The convicts were relieved to be spared but still maintained that they were unjustly imprisoned for a bogus coup. Given the personal acrimony between the prisoners and their captors and their different definition of the coup, we may never discover whether they had really planned a coup against the Bacha in 1995. Five years after the alleged coup, SIP Chairman Mujapwe said, based on the evidence before me, I recommended Generals Obasanjo and Yaradua for trial because there was a coup in the making. And with the evidence before my panel, there were coup plotters in March 1995. However, what is more, the challenges that Abacha faced in two successive years, Abiola's presidential declaration in 1994 and the alleged coup in 1995, elevated his sense of insecurity to the point of paranoia. After the 1995 coup plot, security became his primary preoccupation.